Now you may have noticed with the numbers that I've given you that my superheat seems to be a little higher than my desired 12 to 17 degrees and my subcooling a little bit higher than 15 degrees or ideal subcooling for our system. What could we possibly do to this system to make that better? Well, if you think of subcooling as additional liquid refrigerant that exists before the TXV and after the condenser, we can think of it as stacking up in the condenser. So it appears that the liquid refrigerant takes up a little more space than we may want it to within our condenser. So what could we do to get more of that refrigerant onto this side of the system? Well, our TXV, or our thermostatic expansion valve, that looks like this, has an adjustment. If you take the cap off of the bottom here, you can open or close this valve slightly more. In this instance, would we want to open the valve more or close the valve more? Well, we need to look at more than just our liquid because we have plenty of liquid refrigerant here according to our subcooling of 18 degrees. I'd be okay dropping this number down just a bit. But what's occurring on this side of the system? With 19 degrees of superheat, that means that I have a little more vapor refrigerant on this side than I need. So what I need to do is get a little more of this liquid onto this side of the system. So let's see what that looks like. And imagine, if you will, that we're adjusting this valve to where it closes just a little more. Well, what happened now? If we close the valve a little more, my subcooling is going to go up. Now I may be around 20 degrees of subcooling. I'm stacking more liquid refrigerant in my condenser. So I went the wrong direction. Also, I closed down more, so now my vapor is taking place higher in the system. I'm boiling off even earlier, so my superheat goes up as well to possibly 23 or 24 degrees. So really we want to open this valve. So by opening the TXV, let's look at what we're doing now. When we open up the thermostatic expansion valve, we allow a little more of the liquid that exists in the condenser coil to pass through. When that liquid passes through, we drop our subcooling because now we have less liquid refrigerant existing in the coil. So that temperature comes down and our subcooling may go down exactly where we'd like it to be at 15 degrees. Also, by letting more liquid refrigerant through, now our refrigerant's not going to boil off as early. So now we have less vapor refrigerant that can absorb superheat. So the superheat is also going to drop, preferably down between the range of 12 and 17 degrees. So let's review our example demonstration. Within our refrigeration system, we have 410A refrigerant. That refrigerant has a pressure drop on one side of the compressor and a pressure increase on the other side. That is vapor refrigerant only. So we have superheated vapor on this side and discharge superheated vapor on this side. As the refrigerant flows through the condenser and a condenser fan generally will add ambient air across that 171 degree-ish condenser coil. That 95 degree air is able to remove that heat and discharge it off into the air where no one will notice it. Then our condensed liquid refrigerant travels down and subcooled hits the expansion valve, whether that be a fixed orifice or a thermostatic expansion valve or possibly even electronically controlled expansion valve. As it hits that small orifice, all that liquid refrigerant then has a chance to expand. We get flash gas on the back side, much like you would if you squeezed a water bottle and got a mist. That mist is all of a sudden going to drop in temperature because of a low pressure. 
that low temperature, low pressure liquid vapor mixture that's contained in the evaporator is around 39 to 40 degrees. With our room air going across that, or ambient air if you're doing an outside air application, is going to add heat to that refrigerant. The heat from the air will then enter the refrigerant and cause the refrigerant to boil because it will bring it above saturation temperature. As that refrigerant boils off, it then leaves the evaporator as a superheated vapor, although cool to the touch, and returns to the compressor to be compressed and condensed again. But you may ask, well, why compress the refrigerant? Why not just pump the refrigerant around the system? Where can you think of that you could get rid of heat that is contained in the suction line? Here we have all the system heat we've gained in the evaporator, yet our pipe, our line, suction line, is only 58 degrees Fahrenheit. It'd be very difficult on most days to get rid of that heat. So if you think about the molecules within heat, consider this cube. Within this cube, we may have 100 molecules bouncing about 58 degrees. Let's just say there's 100 of these here. Now, we don't want to add heat to these. We simply want to expose the heat to where we can get rid of it. So we use a compressor. We take this cube and we take that and we compress all of those molecules, that energy, down into a much smaller space. We have the same amount of molecules of heat energy, yet they're so close together now that the pressure goes up. And what have we learned in the past? When the pressure goes up, the temperature goes up. So we take that 58 degree superheated vapor, and now we're around 171 degrees here in our example. A drastic temperature change, although we did not add heat, we did not add energy here. Then we are able to get rid of that heat with our ambient of 95 degrees Fahrenheit. As that 95 degree air blows across that coil with 171 degree refrigerant, we are able to remove the heat very easily. This has been a very basic example of a refrigeration system, and I hope it's helped you today to understand how the refrigeration cycle works. Please return to the Smart Academy for many more videos in the future. Thank you for joining.